We're going to get started here. So. All right, everyone, uh, if you're still excited about chaos, um, you can move out to the hallway track. If, however, you are here to talk about machine learning, oh my god, data and DevOps, when does that ever happen? <laughs> Aliza Sean is here to drop some knowledge on us. So uh, sit tight and uh, sit back and let's do this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before I start, um, I have a request. What I was hoping to do was I was hoping to just put out the bare essentials of what I have to discuss, and then we could have a kind of discussion. And for that to happen, I would want people to be sitting in the front rows. Uh, is, that, is that okay? Can we do that? Don't make me come near you with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Guys, come over to the front rows. Come over. Come over to the front. <laughs> All righty. Uh, let's start. So I'm... Ali Zashan. Um, Ali, I go by Ali, but Ali Zashan, if you ask my mom. Um, I'm from India. I live in the Bay Area, but I work for Coney, which is right here. So I have two reasons to be here. Um, and we're hiring. Let's get the mandatory stuff out of the way. Uh, it's a shameless plug. We're hiring. If you're looking for a job, that's where you'll see the openings, and you can apply. OK, uh, so in this, top, in this discussion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss, basically, I'm not going to try and throw out a lot of best practices or throw out what should, how things should be. What I'm going to talk about is how we worked on a certain project and what were the difficulties that we came across and how we solved them. So think of this more as a case study instead of like a presentation on best case, right? Like, or like the ideal practices. That's not what we're here to discuss. I'm, I'm here to talk about what we did and what worked for us. So that's going to be the theme. Um, that's going to be the theme of the discussion. And let's dive right in. So let me tell you a little story. What my company basically does is we're in the process, we're, we're in the business of building a chat application for banks. A chat application, a multi-tenant SaaS application that lets banks interact with their customers. And in, in the course of those interactions, we collect a ton of conversational data. And since it's the banking domain, we collect a lot of data that contains people's pers personally identifiable information. So you have stuff like people's socials in there. You have people's names in there, people's employers' names, people's kids' names, and stuff like that, right? And when you want to do any kind of machine learning on it, you do not want to compromise customer privacy. Right, So you want to make sure that your data scientists have data to play with, um, but you want to protect customer privacy at the same time. So given this context, um, it, it was this context of this need, this business need, that gave birth to this project, like that created the need for this project. So basically, what we did was we had to create a system that effectively um, masks sensitive information and unstructured text. So if you say, hey, Ali, I have 10 grand in my bank account, we need to transform that into, hey, person, I have money in my bank account. And then we can release that internally to uh, different stakeholders. So that was the general idea of the project. So when we got started with it, right, the product folk had a pretty clear idea about what they wanted to do. They're like, we need to build a system that creates um, copies of the data at, you know, copies of our chat data with sensitive information redacted at periodic in intervals. They were pretty clear about it, and they were pretty confident about it. Um, you bring the data scientist into the picture, right? And the data scientist is like, well, yeah, it's a very trivial problem. It's like a super easy problem. I can pull out my computer, create a Jupyter notebook, and code it out, like, just hammer it out in like five seconds, right? And they're super, they're super like, um, 
they, they, they think it's super easy and they think it's done and the handoff happens. Now, this is when it starts to get hairier, right? Like, the data scientists did something that only they understood. They showed the results to the product people. Product people were like, well, yeah, this serves the business need. But then there's a difference between, there's a fundamental difference between, um, there's a fundamental difference between getting something to work on your personal computer and getting it to work at scale, right? Uh, and that was the problem that we were facing here. So it's like developers are like, huh? What do you expect us to do with this? The ops folk are more like, how do we deploy that thing? Like, how do we deploy a Jupyter Notebook? Like, what's going on? How do we do this? And a complete case of, case of chaos. And it, that's what happens when, you know, um, decisions um, flow, do not, like, when decisions aren't made earlier. So this is the situation you kind of get into when you haven't made the decision on how you're going to build the whole thing out, right? So now what's happened in this scenario is progress come out with a brief. Um, the data science team already knows the solution, and now it's, it's on the engineers, on the devs, and the ops folk to figure out how are we going to build this thing, how are we going to scale this thing. So before we get in, the dev said that we're going to build a named entity recognition system, right? What is named entity recognition? Uh, I'm not here to teach machine learning. This is a DevOps conference, but for the purposes of understanding what named entity recognition is, it's basically think of it like a black box, which essentially converts, um, which essentially labels entities. So here, Tom worked at Food Link in 2017, right? So you, Tom is a person. Food Link is an organization, and so 2017 is time. So we've detected those entities. That is all that the model does, right? And that is all we need to know as a as a developer, as a um, as a ops person. To my point, uh, the good news is is that you don't. Given how abstractions work, it is possible to leverage those to work for us. And the good news is that en engineers or ops people don't really have to care about how a model works. All we need to care about is what we need to do with it, right? Like, how do we use it is what we have to care about. And that will remain the same regardless of, like, what, models in, what model is in there. So um, then our job becomes, how do we build around that? How do we build around that abstraction, that level of abstraction? So. Going a bit further, what, what, what is a model essentially? Like, if you go down to first principles, what, what is a model, right? A model is basically a set of complex mathematical equations that we don't really need to care about, right? It's something that's been done for us, something that has been abstracted out, something that we don't really have to worry unless we're building the model ourselves, which we aren't. We're building a way to host the model and not building the model itself. Uh, so this is about how to work with the model. So. Our job is basically to produce that output by computing those equations specified in the model um, in the most efficient way possible, right? So that is our true goal. Um, when you distill it down, now, when you distill it down, like, when you distill down what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, what do we do? What, what does the developer do at the end of the day? You, when you write code, when you write a function, right? When you write a simple function, what you're doing is, you compute outputs for a given set of inputs. And they're usually the same, right? So how is the model different, right? I'm trying to link the two. So how is the model different? It's, again, you have an abstraction around the model. You call it. You, give it in, you put inputs in. You get outputs out. It's a very black box sort of um, object or a very black box kind of interaction, right? So it's very similar to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'm trying to do right now is um, come to a common ground between what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, like trying to relate machine learning to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not very different, right? It's just one fancy, shiny object or one fancy, shiny black box that we don't fully understand, which is why it's a black box. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is we, shouldn't, we usually shouldn't care, right? It shouldn't scare us into making decisions contrary to what we would otherwise for a similar uh, situation. So distilling that, um, distilling that bit of information, um, 
what is how what does machine learning get converted into right machine learning then gets converted into managing model artifacts right and you manage model artifacts and along with that also comes the task of managing frameworks frameworks that can consume those artifacts and give you the abstraction that you need right so for example tensorflow spacey there's a bunch of frameworks out there so your goal is twofold you need to now manage the artifact the trained model itself that the data scientists gave you uh, think of it as a binary right like you need to uh, manage that and you need to manage um, the framework right now if you look back if you go like if you if you go if you go a few steps back the product brief like in the, in the product pitch of the talk we talked to the the product the product manager said that what they wanted was they wanted periodic intervals which means this is not an always on system right and <coughs> excuse me so this is not an always on system which means if it's periodic and if it's not always on we should try and see if we can do it without having to manage servers right because we want to keep our lives easy as well we do not want to like just build out infrastructure at scale to manage servers that won't be used. And then we have to worry about to bringing them, pulling them down, pulling them up as per demand. So we want to avoid that if possible. So the initial approach we took was go serverless because it was the function was going to be called like once a day or once a few, once, a, once every few days, um, depending on the tenant. So we decided to go ahead with like a serverless approach and see where it goes. And we came up with a bunch of designs in the process. So the first design was this, right? We have two, two functions. Um, and by function, I mean two lambdas here. We, we use AWS, so we use lambdas. But I've used functions because then you can just port it to Azure Cloud or any other offering of your choice. So we have two functions, one which does data IO. So basic hard stuff like querying databases, running a count query, seeing how many, um, seeing how many records are in that query, and then splitting it uniformly across the second function. And what the second function essentially does is, second, so if, you, if the first query pulled up, say, 100,000 messages, and the, first, and, and the machine learning co compute can be, typically is heavier, right? It's a very compute-heavy um, compute function. So what you typically do is you split or you distribute your 100 messages or 100,000 messages in like installments of like you divide them into groups of thousand each and then spread them across the the second compute function. So you you're basically calling thousand hundred thousand by thousand. So ten raised to three. That's thousand instances of the lower function. And then once you've returned generated results there, you um, write it to the target database. So that is a very simple model, very simple thing that we started with, and we realized that this has some serious shortcomings, right? Now, one of, one of the major shortcomings here is that this will work only if the size of your model that your data scientist gave you added to the framework or library that you're using to consume that model, right? You have to sum those sizes up, and it must be less than the mac maximum packet size of your serverless framework. Now, or your whatever offering you're using. So going with AWS, like in the, using the case of AWS Lambda, the maximum packet size is 50 meg zipped, right? And 250 meg unzipped, which it does internally. So you cannot upload an unzipped version. You have to upload a zipped version. And Spacey, the framework that we were using itself is 302 megs. The pre-trained NER model that the data scientists gave us was 91, was 91 megs. So you add those two together, and there's no way we're going to be able to fit it into our serverless function, right? So that's when we were like, is serverless still the better idea? So we could have chosen to dump it, but we decided to go ahead further and see where we can take this. And before we did that, we made sure that we looked at the constraints that FAA, that function as a service offerings um, impose. So one of them are execution time limits. We weren't too worried about that because we had, you know, per we had solved them via parallelization already. Memory limits, again, not a huge issue because we were able to, and by memory, I mean RAM, right? So memory limits were, again, not a big deal because we, we had managed to overcome them. We had written code, which was efficient enough. Um, deployment packet size limit was what was uh, the bottleneck. Um, local storage limit, we hadn't come across that problem yet because we weren't leveraging local storage, as the documentation says you shouldn't. Uh, and 
cold start times are a problem. So when, when, you're, when, you're, when your function hasn't been executed for, say, 40 minutes, right? It's going to start from scratch. It's not going to have a container um, built for it in the back end on the provider side. So when, when the cold start happens, you typically will run into long, huge delays. So those are the problems. Those are the constraints that we, we saw. And we look to work within them and look to work in a way or design or approach the problem in such a way that we you know, stayed within those constraints and try to do the best we could do. So we came up with this interesting question that instead of trying to feed it through, uh, instead of trying to feed it through the deployment package itself, what if we downloaded the framework and model at runtime? So every time you execute a function, it pulls it down from an object store and writes it to the temp, temp space, right? So that was the approach we decided to take. So now we weren't leveraged so far. We weren't leveraging the temp space that's offered, and. The documentation guides you against not doing that, but if you know what you're doing, I think anything is fair game. So again, that's a personal, my personal opinion. So we figured that we kind of, we sort of knew what we were doing, so we started using the temp space for our role. So what we would do is we downloaded the entire framework, so Spacey and the model that the data scientists gave, scientists gave us, and we tried to download them from an S3 bucket into local storage, and then utilize them. That, that way, we circumvented the packet size limitation. And then we came up with a second architecture. right? So in this architecture, it remains pretty much the same, except that you have the additional bit of pulling the model and your framework from the model art artifact store and writing it to temp storage and then consuming it from temp storage. right? So running it off of temp storage, running it off of your temp, temp space. Um, that worked. That did that did do the job, but it wasn't elegant, right? It wasn't it wasn't elegant for a variety variety of reasons. Um, one of them was we were doing repeat downloads, repeat repeat downloads of the same data over and over again incurs high incurs a network cost. Not a high network cost, but incurs a network cost. It's still better than you know managing servers up to a fair, a decent scale, but um, it incurs a network cost, right? Which was unnecessary. And then since we were doing, since we were performing repetitive computations, we had the runtime, um, we had the runtime problem. Like we had additional runtime that we could have avoided. Right? So we had a bunch of redundancies in there that we, we wanted to get, get rid of. And we tried a bunch of things. So what lines were we thinking along? We were thinking of, we thought of like, so we noticed that cold starts were a problem. And we figured that typical packages that you get. And we were using Python here. So um, some, of, some of the things that I say will be Python specific. But a lot of packages tend to be general purpose, right? So when you have general purpose pack packages, they tend to have a bunch of stuff that you, don't, you won't really need, right? So we decided to try and eliminate or minimize. You cannot eliminate cold starts, but you can minimize cold starts, right? So we decided to approach it with a two-prong approach of like minimizing your cold start time. So like, make sure that most of the starts that you make or that the function makes, or uh, the most critical starts that your function makes are, are warm starts, which means that a lot of the init initialization and stuff which goes on in the back end, which is abstracted out from us, um, actually takes place. And our functions execute faster than they would. right? And the second one was smart packaging. So you try and push as much as you can through your um, Container upload through your initial container upload. So those were the two two uh, paths we decided to look at further. So packaging tips: um, Python, right? Interpreted language. There's unit tests. They come with your package. Lowest common denominator: lose them. We lost them. We we shaved off two meg from 302 meg, which is not a big saving, but it's. I mean, if you're if you're trying to reduce, it's still a reduction, right? And then. The second point comes down to knowing your framework well, or getting to know your framework well. Because once you start de doing a deep dive into the framework and how it works and stuff like that, you figure out that there's a bunch of redundancies that you will probably never use. right? And we figured that the framework that we were using, Spacey, came with a bunch of languages that we weren't even going to touch. It came with, it came with uh, 
any possible language you can think of. There was Dutch, there was a bunch of European languages. There was Thai. There was different um, different tokenizers. Different like it supported multiple orthographies and a bunch of stuff that we weren't really leveraging because we were just working with English, right? So we deleted those additional languages that came in, and we bought down the size, the framework size from 300 meg to 15 meg, right? Now that was an awesome saving, and our code base was like. Our code wasn't even a meg in size, so basically, what we could do is we could club this along with um, we could club this along with our initial uploaded package, and save save that additional download that happens, right? So we that's that's one thing that helped us um, save memory. A second optimization, but a micro optimization is, I'm not sure I would recommend that in all cases, is just compiling your Python source into bytecode and then deleting the source files and just uploading the bytecode. So what it does is effectively when you try and run in, in the serverless, when the serverless uh, environment or the FAS uh, vendor tries to run that, run that code, and it, what happens is uh, as you, as you probably know is it converts it into it interprets the code that you've written and converts it into bytecode right so you basically skip that step when you try and run directly run bytecode so it gives you micro optimizations it gives you micro optimizations but they're not very like easy to work with like if your code fails it'll be very hard to do a trace back and you know debug that code so it's it's not a very big boost but it's still a boost and if you need it by all means use it but know that what it entails. So that said, we then went on to the build process. Like, how do you build, right? Like, how do you build this out at scale? Because, like, or how do you build this code out? You have code. How do you build an archive from it? How do you build a zip file from it that you can, you know, deploy to, um, deploy to your cloud? So we decided to use a container container pipeline because we wanted to when you're doing machine learning, typically you end up using a lot of the code for efficiency reasons is pushed down to lower la level languages like C. So you want to make sure that if you're running on Amazon Linux, those uh, low level C dependencies are um, are compiled for are compiled from source for Amazon Linux and not some other variant, right? So which is why we did a containerized. Um, a containerized pipeline, a container-powered pipeline, which essentially um, compiles all of that for uh, compiles all of that for your your OS version, which was Amazon Linux in this case, and just spits out spits out a zip file to a shared volume, right? And then you consume it from there um, using whatever. So that was that was the idea. Um, we came up with a build process. Um, Dockerize the build pipeline to ensure compatibility only added code that was necessary. So we, we could bring down uh, the, the size of the deployment by quite a big factor. And then logging, right? <coughs> um, we implemented end to end auditability. So anytime a function was invoked, there was a request, unique request ID that was generated at source. And once that request ID was generated at source, we um, we passed that around, kept it consistent, passed it through the different processes it went, and then we linked it at each. Like we passed that request ID to each each of the moving moving parts, and we logged it in CloudWatch. And what that what that gave us was end-to-end -end traceability, right? So if you wanted to trace what happened to request X that came in at 10:05 today morning, so you could you could get complete visibility into did the code fail? Was there some sort of platform dependency that was hit and things like that. So it gave us good traceability and that was a good uh, feature of the platform. And one of the things that you that we that was critical to us was from a compliance standpoint was to just log the hashes of input and output because we could not afford to because logging the input output itself could have amounted to a data leak. So we had to log hashes of the input and output to make sure that you know we're staying compliant. So this is the modified architecture. Now here, what we did was we there's a trigger which is triggering the function find, but the notable additions there are like how the model artifact store and temp store behave. So now 
the model artifact store only contains um, only contains a model. And AWS Lambda has a limit of 512 meg. We weren't maxing that out. So tomorrow, if our data scientists build a better model that performs better, we have those 512 meg. And we also have some storage in our d initial deployment package. So we might also be able to do, like, if it comes to that, we might also be able to do, like, split our model binary into two parts, right? Like, you take one of that part through the deployment package, provide it through the deployment package, and then the second part you can provide via a network download. So you would, you would want to minimize that component, but we had that just in case we wanted to do it. And what we did was, for warm starts, right? Like, now uh, looking at this architecture, for warm starts, what we did was we would download a model artifact or whatever needed to be downloaded to our temp storage. And typically, we tested this, uh, and we noticed that AWS Lambda keeps it, does not delete your container for at least 30 minutes. So if it's being used within a time period of 30 minutes, it's still warm. The, so if you run, run Lambda at like right now, right, and you run it within 30 minutes from now, it'll be a warm start. It won't necessarily be a cold start. So we figured that out through experimentation. Again, it, nowhere in the documentation does it say that, but this is what we figured out. Um, and what we would do is we would just, so if we knew that our cron job was supposed to start that at, say, or was going to fire like a million requests at like 10, we would just warm it, warm it up at like 9.50. So what that did was the artifacts were downloaded to temp. And we checked, like each time the function ran, it checked whether it was there was something already in temp. And temp is shared across different invocations. So it checked that if the artifact was already there in temp. If it was, then we didn't download it again. And that's how we um, saved a lot of compute and a lot of resource. And systems ready to use, um, that's. That's it for me. Um, questions? Let's let's open it up to interactions. How did you manage uh, security for for the client data? Since um, Lambda functions may, for example, not be that secure, they might share information. Oh. Can you please be a bit loud? I I guess how the question. How did you about handle security, the security right? of of the custody of the data that you were transforming between? between the database and the Lambda function? Um, so that's a good question. Between the database and the Lambda, what's happening is we are, um, we had encrypted channels through which, so we had a one, we had, so the data that's stored in is, is, is in an encrypted database, and there is encrypt, encryption in transit. And the way we shared the data with our customers was via, so the second, if we go back, um, the target DB, right? The target DB essentially is a customer-facing S3 bucket with with a um, with a simple static web page put on it, which just you know lists uh, lists out your files on there. So those files are GPG uh, GPG encrypted. So that is we already have encryption uh, at rest, and then we also had encryption in transit. So even even we cannot look at the data that we've generated because it's uh, encrypted using GPG and only they control the the private key. So it, it is signed by us, but even we cannot access it. So before you started deleting languages with the Spacey framework, did you try another framework? Yeah, we played around with a bunch of frameworks. Um, we played with TensorFlow. You can push TensorFlow up there, uh, and with TensorFlow 2.0 coming out, it, it'll. My my gut feeling is that it'll, it'll probably get easier. I haven't tried the TF TF 2.0 alpha, but my feeling is that it'll get easier because you're gonna lose a lot of like the graph, um, the gr like manually running the graphs. Like it's it's gonna be more native Python, so it might be, it might actually be a better option than Spacey. We use Spacey because well. The data scientists gave us a model that was spacey. So you can't fight with them. Other questions? Oh, over here. Hey. 
Um, have you tried any acceleration, like getting on a GPU or anything on the back end, or did you pick CPU stuff for your uh, Lambda functions? Um, no. I, I think we've, um, so the work that we've done is we do use GPUs for training, but in our experience, we've seen that, especially for language-based language tasks, GPUs do not give you a very uh, significant boost in uh, inference at inference time, right? Um, they're pretty good when you're training. They're pretty fast. They give you an amazing speed up. But when you're trying to trying to run in for inference, which is what we're doing here, they do not make a lot of difference. In fact, you'd be surprised if your if your load is not, you know, if your load is not consistent enough, it might it might actually be slower than a CPU. So GPUs GPUs work well for inference only when you have like 100% load 100% of the time, right? That's when that's when GPUs are amazing, and that's when you get the true uh, benefits of parallelization. And a lot of it also depends on the model that you're trying to use. So if you're lever using something like a convolutional neural network, it's an easily paralyze parallelizable model. So those models, you'll see better uh, performance with GPUs. But if you're using a recurrent structure that literally is linear, like that scales linearly with, with respect to your input text. So the benefits of GPUs and things like that, and mo and most of our models were recurrent. So the benefits of a GPU there are limited. Um, and then one more was, um, have you tried any inference servers? You know, I know a lot of them are for GPU-based stuff, but there are some open source uh, CPU-backed ones. Uh, do you look at any of that before you implemented your own inference? Um, no. The, the idea of this project was, so I have in a different capacity, but not with regard to this, because the very idea of doing, going down the serverless route was to not have to manage servers, right? And there was, I mean, outside of FAS, we could have used something like AWS. Um, what's that thing? I forget its name. SageMaker? Is that what it is? There's SageMaker, and there's like a container running, like a managed container service called Fargate. So we, we toyed with those things, but ultimately, we thought that they were too powerful for our, at least for this application. Like, we didn't. Okay. Uh, really quickly, uh, I have a question in terms of uh, almost a follow-up to that about benchmarking, because obviously when you're doing this, there's the time it takes to move data from the source database into your function, the time for your function to execute, and the time for it to move data back to your target database. Um, did you, when you were finding this, find that this was able to concurrently um, pull enough data at, um, at once where the data move into your model didn't be didn't become a bottleneck, or uh, um, um, or was or, or was that fast enough? Um, so. The data did take time, given the scenario situation that we were running it in. Running inference did take time, but we, how, how we overcame that was we distributed computation across multiple small chunks, right? So we call 1,000 instances of function 2. So to process 100,000 messages, we call 1,000 inst instances of function 2, right? And thank you. We call 1,000 instances of function 2, and then the load is distributed. So. Yes, it is, in, it is intensive to pass resources to that function, but now each, each instance is not, is not processing more than 1,000 functions, 1,000 records, and we know we have benchmarked the time it takes to process 1,000 functions, right? And if the query is heavy enough, what we do is function one spins up a clone, like calls itself again. So it's, think of it like we're trying to do something like MapReduce, but without using a MapReduce framework. We're just doing it with lambdas. So that calls a second copy. Right, it calls a second count. Runs first runs a count query. Count queries are simple. It gives you the count, right? They give you the count, and then you say, okay, this function is capable of processing 100,000 in time. So then we split it into two, and then let it, you know, and then so on and so forth, right? And then it takes it over from there. That's all we have time for right now. I would like to encourage you, however, since the questions were great to uh, potentially pitch an open space after the Ignites today and suckers Mr. Katri, right, <laughs> into uh, explaining some more about what they're doing. So with all that, thank you very much, sir.